Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Indie Bio event about data and biotech. I'm pleased to be joined by three amazing founders who are all using data in very unique ways today. Joining us today are Amal Grafstra of Aviva Key. Uh, Amal, hi, thank you so much for having this conversation with us. Sure. Uh, also joining us is the CEO of Annika Biosciences, which some of you may know uh, formerly as Carver. Uh, is probably the founder here that I've known the longest since we met back in 2017, although I wasn't able to uh, be part of his journey through Rebel Bio. Uh, this is Vishal Buyan. Hi, Vishal. Uh, I'm sorry, Vishal, if you were saying hi, I didn't hear you. Just oh, so yes, you know. hi, hi, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, no problem. Just want to make sure you're not on mute yeah. for that conversation. <laughs> Great. Um, and our third founder is Adam Kirkowitz of Biomage, a company turning every research scientist into a bioinformatician. And uh, I'm also pleased to say was the 1,000th investment from SOSD, uh, the parent fund behind IndieBio. So uh, hey. Adam, <laughs> hi, thanks for joining us. Hi, Julie, hi, Julie. Re really good to be here. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that we um, that we were part of, of uh, SOSD's journey. Yes, well, it's, it's only just beginning since you were part of the most recent IndieBio New York cohort, but we're really uh, psyched to have you here today. Great. Absolutely. So I haven't introduced myself. I'm Julie. I'm the communications director here at IndieBio in New York. Um, IndieBio, for those of you who are not aware, is the world's leading biotech accelerator. We work with companies that are using biotechnology to solve the, the world's largest problems in human and planetary health, um, spanning every single thing that you can think of that uh, touches biotechnology. And uh, during the four month uh, mentor intensive program, companies receive mentorship, they receive um, workshops, they receive $250,000 in capital to move their tech forward. Um, and as you may see behind me, um, lab space, we've recently moved into our New York lab and we're, we're very happy to be here. Uh, today, we are going to focus on the many ways that biotechnology can touch on data. All right. Let's dive in. I think that the best way to begin the conversation today is for each of our founders to describe what it is that your company makes as its product, um, how data is incorporated into this product, either as the final thing or as part of the, the value proposition. And if you could maybe touch on your business model, um, that, that would be, uh, I think, an additional valuable piece of information. So I'm going to hand the mic over to Amal to kick things off. Uh, Amal, if you wouldn't mind, just briefly in a, in a couple of minutes describing DivaKey. Yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, so yeah, uh, DivaKey is a, a company that's focused on secure, cryptographically secured, implantable uh, transponders, so RFID and NFC transponders. And we make, um, primarily at this point, we make transponders for the purpose of secure identity applications. Um, so the data involved in, in doing something like that is mostly about shuttling cryptograms between platforms and, pro, and um, you know, services and, and APIs to the chip through uh, devices like smartphones with NFC, for example. So, you know, there is, oddly, there is a lot of concern about, um, you know, oh, it's a microchip implant. Uh, are you going to track me? Are you going to, who's going to steal my data? That kind of, those kind of questions. And uh, the, the reality is th those questions are based on um, kind of miseducation that comes from Hollywood movies. Uh, there is no tracking capability. We don't track users around. In fact, the phones that you use are much worse at that uh, than anything that you implant, at, at least today, could ever be. Um, so really, our, our focus on, on data is really connecting systems and making people more privacy aware, more private, and more secure. Um, in the future, and in fact, I just I, I have a, a prototype here <laughs> that I just put in yesterday. Um, we are expanding into bioinformatics, that kind of thing, so uh, medical data collection, that type of thing, and that's where the question really will become: you know, what kind of information collected? How is it secured? How is it shared? Who's it shared with? And you know, in that, uh, you know, you look at you look at companies like Fitbit, where they had uh, you know non-medical status, and it was just a kinesiology device, and you know, you could share the data with anybody and the company was using, you know, that data to, to make assessments of their customers. Um, so 
you know, as they transitioned into a medical device company, they, the, the, there were some laws that kicked in and they had to change the way they handled the data. Uh, but, you know, these are, these are all questions that we are now grappling with, and particularly with GDPR and like all the EU da and personal data protections uh, that come along with it, in, including, you know, US HIPAA compliance, that kind of stuff. So uh, it's a very interesting time <laughs> for sure. So that's very interesting. Thank you so much for kicking things off. I was going to ask a question, but I think you may have answered it about where these devices will be implanted. Um, but maybe you could talk about how many one might use and whether you could use different frequencies in order to oh, carry sure. different types of information. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah. so initially I started out uh, just selling uh, basic transponders through a company called Dangerous Things. <laughs> so these are for kind of like the early adopter biohacker types. Um, but they're not secure. They're not really able to be used for larger applications like banking and that's th this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, RFID in general as a technology is kind of an umbrella. And under that umbrella, there's a lot of frequencies and data protocols and standards. So, you know, right now I have six devices, you know, you can't really see them or tell that I have them, but I have six devices in me. Well, seven now because of yesterday. But, um, but the point is that, um, you know, when it comes to compatibility with existing systems, badges and things like this, when I was at IndieBio, um, I actually brought some of these transponders and we implanted some of the cohort so that we could put our badges on our hands and then go through the building with our implants. Um, so those kind of applications, you know, required a specific kind of chip with a specific compatibility with the existing system. Uh, the, the goal with VivoKey, of course, is to kind of become more of the apple of the implant kind of concept where, you know, we will release a door lock, we'll release software and services that all work with VivoKey implants. Uh, and it just works, right? Rather than having to worry about having six or seven implants, we want you to have a VivoKey implant and then you know, use those services and devices that, that it works with, including things like applications where we par might partner with, um, you know, practice management companies where they, you walk in, you check in just by kind of putting your hand into like a little ring and it collects, you know, information about your, uh, your basic setup, uh, you know, like, you know, blood pressure. Well, maybe not blood pressure, but just some things that we can share, but also securely cryptographically checks you in. It opens your exact medical record, not like, you know, some people might have two or three medical records in a system because one day they, you know, oh, we can't find her, they spelled her name slightly wrong or something and they open a new record. So all that goes away, you're cryptographically, unequivocally identified correctly, uh, all with just like putting your hand in a thing and you're done. You go in the doctor's office room and they, you do the same and your record comes up, there's no question, this is your medical record, that kind of thing. Very, very interesting. And uh, I see that there's a lot of different medical applications, but I was just thinking um, how convenient it would be to have one of those things as we've had to use these badges at just about every entrance that uh, we go into nowadays. Well, uh, talk to me after, we can get set up. <laughs> awesome. All right, um, next, uh, can we hear a little bit about how Annika is changing the security of the supply chains uh, as the world becomes more and more global? Sure. Michelle? Um, so sort of on a high level, what we do is we use microbes as tracking devices. So what we do is we convert data, digital data, into strands of DNA. We insert that little bit of DNA into an, a microorganism, a probiotic microorganism, to be honest. Uh, and then we can sort of apply that organism and sort of uh, have it hitch a ride on any food or agricultural product or, or really anything through the supply chain. Um, and what the reason we use a microbe to do it is because we engineer it to go into a spore. So a dormant state that allows it to be impervious to high temperatures and UV light, sort of protect that DNA barcode through transit. And so why this is important is because you can spray romaine lettuce, for example, and you can mix it around and wash it and treat it, uh, microwave it. You can have it decay for a month and we can still re-identify sort of each leaf back to its origin. And so based off the different kind of requirements in different supply chains, um, that microbial tag allows us to get just really granular information throughout the entire transit uh, without having to worry about things like, you know, cross-contamination or of tags, I mean, uh, or, you know, rubbing off from, from one thing to another. So it's just an incredibly hardy package um, of information. And then we couple that with a quick readout device that allows you to not have to send things out of the supply chain to a lab, which is how they're done now, um, but just sort of verify um, these types of, of quality assurance and quality checks uh, on the spot. 
So I'm, I'm guessing that using these spores makes the organism metabolically inert. So you don't have to worry about things like the low level of DNA mutation as exactly organisms right. they're, made. They're totally inactivated. So we've removed I think, three or four genes responsible for that germination. So really what we have is a, just a particle um, in essence. I mean, it's just, it's just inactive. And, and you mentioned that it's a probiotic and you used lettuce as your example. So is this something that you imagine is going to be mostly used in food supply chains? I could see that being extraordinarily useful, but perhaps you can even branch out into non-edible things. Yeah, so, so we've worked with the beers uh, on diamonds. We've gotten inquiries about tagging explosives, uh, to be hmm. honest. Um, picture a big mining company whose explosives end up in a, in a civil war. We, we've heard everything. Uh, both organic and non-organic in terms of applications. Um, we're just focusing this year particularly on romaine lettuce because of, of customer demand, but the applications are actually uh, just really endless in terms of how you could apply this to, to a number of different things. Absolutely. Wonderful summary. Uh, and we'll get back with, with additional questions, but I want to move on to Adam. Adam, can you talk a little bit about Biomage and the software platform? platform that you've developed and um, are now uh, bringing onboarding customers right and left. Absolutely. So, um, so at Biomage, what we're building is we're building software, which can turn uh, every biologist into a bioinformatician. And the reason it's important is because there are a lot of um, very bright people at um, a lot of different universities, including one of our customers, um, Harvard Medical School. Who, um, who can use biology to discover uh, drugs for um, diseases such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, or diseases like Alzheimer's. Um, however, the, the type of technologies that, that they get to work with nowadays um, actually produce a lot of data. So biology used to be historically a low throughput science, a science where one experiment would correspond to one data point um, usually a smudge on a piece of gel, uh, <clears throat> but but nowadays uh, nowadays we live we live uh, we live in a in a world where a single scientific experiment can produce um, even two hundred million um, two hundred million uh, data points, and it's it's really just this 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 journey from a low throughput science to a high throughput science, which uh, which has which has made it really difficult for for all the biologists even even in those top tier institutions like. Like Harvard Medical School to, to just really to just really deal with the volume of data and really to be able to analyze it, and and at Biomage we've um, we built we built a we built an open source product that makes it easy to analyze um, to analyze a specific type of data called single cell called single cell RNA seq data, and um, the data that we analyze doesn't actually so one of your questions here Julie at the beginning of. Of this um, of this round of questions was like how do we how do we incorporate data in our product? And um, actually, we don't we don't create our own data. So we are not a um, we're not a data company like like Google is a data company or like a Facebook is a data company. We enable people to to understand their data. We enable enable research scientists to understand their data, in which um, through which they can they can create. Um, New discoveries that can lead to new treatments and 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 human and human disease, and the business model question, which was also also something you asked us at the at the, at the very beginning, is I think I think that's that's really that's actually really interesting because for an open source company, um, you know, one somebody could tell us, you know, you're an open source company, how can you make any money? Um, to which I like to answer that the fact that you own a horse. Doesn't mean that you don't have to pay for the um, for for all, all the all the things that are connected to 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 you owning owning the horse, such as such as the feed and and um, and, and other elements. So for a company like Biomage, what we what we sell to our customers is we sell additional feature development, we sell deployments, uh, we sell um, we sell we sell all the things around around the software, which allows us to which allows us to have an open source. An open source bit of software that people trust because it's easily verifiable. Um, so that's that's really that's really the business model. Very very interesting, and uh, thank you for addressing all three of my questions. There, I know I, I tend to ask more than one question, uh, so it's uh, more on me than than on anyone who doesn't answer all of them. But I love this this collection 
of startups because I think that you guys are all using data in extremely interesting, um, applicable, but varied ways, right? Like I think many people, when they think data and biotech, think more along the lines of the Google uh, model, right? Like collecting a lot of things and being able to find them. But we have people who are working on making, giving people ownership, I guess you could say, of their, of their data with the RFID chips and uh, other types of implantables, being able to secure uh, the location or the, the source of various places in a world where uh, we're increasingly globalized and helping people to sort through their own data and giving them ownership in that sense uh, of their own analysis. So really, really interesting collection of people working with data. Now, there is one question already in the chat, um, and it's, it's addressed to Amal, but I think that this is one that all three of you could answer. Um, the question is, Amal, what is the need for these devices to be implanted? And I actually want to reword that a little bit in terms of how did you, uh, Adam, Vishal, Amal, how did you see an opportunity to build a business, right? Um, how did you know that this was an area that you could create a product that people would pay money for? Uh, and how much iteration was there around building that product? Uh, sure. But since the, the question was first to you, Amal, I, I will pass the mic back over to you. Okay, uh, I'll try to be quick, but um, essentially the short story is at around 2005, I was working in a medical office doing IT support for small clinics and uh, I had a door that would just um, lock behind me. It was an emergency door and it wasn't meant for egress, but I used it that way. Um, but, you know, when I'm working IT after hours, two in the morning and I pop outside to get something from the car and forgot my keys. Now I'm stuck, right? And I can't, you know, I can't do anything. So uh, I just over time got really irritated with the idea that, um, you know, keys are this archaic form of, you know, cut metal um, identity token uh, from like 700 BC uh, that represents me to the door. And I wanted the door to just know that it was me and let me in. So uh, the first application was access control. It was just to be able to go through the door without much hassle and without more, more importantly, without having to carry or manage anything. And so, you know, to, kind of to address the, uh, the first part of the question, why implant these things versus, you know, carrying things around. And the real, the real answer is management. And, um, you know, you might lose your keys once a month or once a year or never, but you always manage them. You always have to manage your wallet full of tokens, which are the payment cards, the identity cards. You have to manage your key ring, which is full of cut metal tokens that represent you to locks. There, you have to manage passwords, which are identity tokens, which represent you to systems. And so the idea that you can simply and cheaply uh, be able to uh, kind of replace all of that stuff with something that is managementless, frictionless, it just goes in, it's safer than an ear piercing to get, it's quicker than an ear piercing. Um, it just made sense to me. So, you know, I, I put this thing here in my hand. This is since 2005 and I still use it today. Um, you know, the, the a long life. I, I just wanted to yeah, comment yeah. on that. That's so 15 years of one device. Most devices, when we think about what we purchase, you know, two years, maybe four, if you're lucky, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we design our stuff to at least go for 30 years, if not more. Uh, VivoKey stuff is good for 50 plus years. So, um, but the, the point being that, you know, I, I did it just as a convenience application for myself, uh, but then other people got wind of it and got very interested. Um, and then, you know, as the maker revolution started happening and people, you know, getting into Arduino and home, you know, homebrew electronics projects, I really started to get a lot of inquiries and I was like, man, I got to figure out either I got to ignore this or I got to you know, wrap a business model around it. And so I started dangerous things in for, for early, you know, biohacker types in 2013, but even rapidly by, by 2018, uh, which is when we participated in IndieBio, um, the, uh, the, you know, the type of customer changed dramatically from like, give me the data sheet to what kind of cool things can I do with this, right? And they weren't familiar with the technology, but they were very interested in doing it. So, um, you know, VivoKey was launched to solve not just where are my keys problem, but also bigger problems like uh, international identity, secure banking, like all, all this kind of stuff. Um, and, and really the, the concept, again, when you kind of talk about, well, I, I don't mind, I don't mind putting my password in, I don't mind, you know, doing this stuff, you know, I noticed that all the panel members have glasses, right? Well, there's people that don't want to manage those glasses, they get LASIK, right? It's changing their body to fix a problem, or in their case, in some people's cases, you can augment yourself. So in, in our case, you know, we're augmenting your human capabilities with a very simple chip implant that does its job. Uh, I like to say, 
you know, you're sitting there now and your kidneys are working hard for you, but you don't give them a second thought. This is exactly how this technology works. It just sits there. It's accessible, always there. You never think about it. It's frictionless. For me, you know, if I can get rid of, and for, for 16 years, I've never had to manage my keys. That's one third of my phone, wallet, keys, typical management burden. Um, if I can get rid of two thirds, get rid of the wallet as well, get rid of passport. Like there, there's all these things that I could do to kind of enhance my personal freedom without, you know, compromising convenience uh, and, and increasing security at the same time, why wouldn't I do that? So, um, yeah, I, I, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> it's, it's great. It sounds like um, instead of having to go out and do customer discovery, customers were actually coming to you and saying, can you do this? Which is, uh, I think, something that every founder would like to happen. Yeah. Um, as you can think about going into some of these medical spaces, are there different types of compatibilities that you have to consider um, or regulatory paths to work with the FDA to, to carry this information? Yes, uh, somewhat. So, so the idea of FDA medical device uh, you know, categorization is interesting. So you, you can make a thing, for, right? So I mentioned Fitbit earlier, but um, you, in, in our case, you know, we can make a chip that we can use with uh, third-party systems, our own systems, um, you know, NFC phones, all of that stuff. And it doesn't qualify as a medical device because it doesn't tick any of the three yeah. requirements or, or you know, conditions under which a device becomes a medical device. And the biggest one is uh, it is not used in diagnosis or treatment of disease. Because it's not used in that fashion, it's not required, just like body jewelry is not required to be FDA approved. But going into the patient identity and medical records application, the use of this technology, that dictates we need to go through uh, FDA approval, which uh, in this case is not all that arduous. Um, there's already a pre-existing product that attempted to enter the space. Um, and so we can, uh, you know, they had a lot of problems with how they approached the market, but uh, but we can attempt to do this, um, you know, with a, with a basic 510k filing, which is saying it's exactly this or extremely similar, right? And so they already had approval in 2004, actually. So hmm. it's not going to be an arduous task to do. It just matters that we have to, you know, kind of um, space those regulatory hurdles out and, uh, and overcome them when applications are ready. Yeah, that makes sense. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Vishal, I, I know that you have been working with different supply chains, as you mentioned. Uh, I wonder how you saw that there was a need for better management of the, the sourcing and the um, following the cargo as it's moving from one country or from one container ship to another, uh, and how you thought to use microbes and DNA as the answer to that question or to that problem. It's kind of funny because you're actually part of this story. Um, <laughs> know, but uh, I was actually working in finance. My background is in finance and I'm not a scientist. Uh, I was making angel investments and just doing side projects. One of those things was a CPG product, a consumer product, uh, a snack food uh, made out of lotus seeds from India. And they were actually sold all over New York City. They were like Google headquarters and Facebook, just like a fun pet project. Um, and we were importing like, you know, thousands of pounds of these things from, from India. And they kept getting held up at the border. Uh, particularly, we had to, in one instance, discard 3,000 pounds of them uh, and work with the FDA because of a pathogen outbreak and a, a banned substance that was sprayed on them. And so this, this, this hobby became a complete nightmare <laughs> where I was spending thousands of dollars like on, this, on something that's just gone wrong. And so working with the FDA to do all these assays to determine sort of what happened to this product and actually what its true origin was blew my mind. Like, why don't we know this? You know, this seems like common sense stuff. Um, and this, this problem just kind of like, seeing the, the the scale of this in the in the dock you know at the shipping uh, uh you know with on the cargo ships was amazing because when i was talking to the fda it's like yeah not everything gets checked you know that this problem is way bigger than just this container it's everything and sort of the complexity of the food system just became very clear to me and the fact that you've got to do like dozens of different tests to verify things both that touch food safety and traceability just seemed like a massive problem uh, and sort of at the same time, I had taken a class with Julie at GenSpace called Biohacking 101 or something. And the two things just sort of merged in my head, which was, you know, what if there was a, 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 like a friendly microbe that we could use that said, hey, this is the product that you think it is. Uh, and that was sort of really the synthesis of the idea, which is, you know, I saw all the different ways people were using sort of synthetic biology 
And I thought if we could leverage this as a, as a utility, as opposed to something that's going to necessarily do something, you know, whether that's, um, you know, add nutrient value or any of that, if we just literally use it as a utility, this could solve a problem that I've, I've, I've kind of come up close and personal with on this really big scale. So that was really how it started. That's very interesting. You were kind of your own customer uh, with a problem, yeah. right? And then that's you exactly recognize right. what, yeah, I, I, that's very interesting. Um, so similar question that I posed to Amal, as you developed your product and started to deploy it, were there certain regulatory hurdles? Uh, I'm thinking more along the lines of EPA than FDA here. Uh, if you're going to take, even if it's an inert microbe, are, are there certain hurdles that you have to cross uh, in order to use that product? Uh, so, so the biggest one for us has been FDA and it's oh, really it FDA. Ob obtaining grass designation. Um, but because these are inert and because these are in a very faint um, kind of LOD, so you know the, the, the amount that's being sprayed on is very minor. Um, that's really that's really the the things that we need to prove to the FDA. So, the, but the grass certification that we're getting, the no objections letter, um, we're very confident we'll receive that pretty much by the end of this year. Um, again, because they're inert. The, the, the edits that we make are very small. We're talking about, you know, about 50 to 100 nucleotides. Um, the fact that it doesn't germinate is huge. So that's mm -hmm. all reasons why um, we're very confident in that. In terms of EPA, um, it, it really depends on the fact that they're, in, the fact that they're not germinating is, is the biggest reason we can circumvent that. And then where it's being applied in the processing or in the supply chain. So. In the lettuce, for example, it's actually post-harvest and it's mixed with the wash water. So it's actually not touching in the field. I see. There's one reason the EPA is not involved. Um, and that's basically the case. A lot of it is, it doesn't really need to be at the field, but just post-harvest or post, you know, whatever that system is, post-mining or whatever it is. So um, that's usually how it's added in. And so you mentioned very low dosing. Like, can you tell us uh, exactly like how many, I mean, they're not even really microbes. They're like microbial parts, almost like a shield exactly. for the DNA, right? Because you have right. to protect that DNA, right? But the best way to think about it, so it, it differs between supply chains, but if you take a lettuce, for example, a couple of drops of the tag in, let's say two or three liters of water would cover 200 pounds of, of lettuce, for example. So really we're talking about very faint amounts of, of the microbe or the microbial tag. Okay, um, and a question for you from uh, the audience. Can you, can you use these to verify that these products have been ethically sourced? I imagine it depends on who your um, yeah. customer is, but uh, we actually, so in, in cacao and coffee, this is a big issue, especially in Europe and the United States where, where like ethical sourcing is legislated pretty much. So we've done things like uh, we, this was one of the coolest demos, which was we took coffee beans, roasted them, like brewed cups of coffee, and then like traced them back to the origin to show that these were ethically sourced cups of coffee and these weren't. So you, yeah, we, we, like uh, in coffee in particular, I think there's like 22 different certifications that they need. And you can, you can embed those, so to speak, in these tags, you know, the, the, the authenticity. The other interesting thing I, I discovered is there's a big black market for these certifications, um, whether it's ethically sourced or, or, or whatever, where they trade actually, so you can slap them on your unethically, un unethically sourced coffee and still push that off to the big, the, big, the big buyers and the big importers. So the ability to tag the actual product and not the packaging is just incredibly helpful. Okay, well, that's very interesting. And kind of gets into the next area I want to dive into. But first, I want to make sure that we talk a little bit about the origin story of Biomage and how, Adam, you were able to identify a need for the product, the software platform, uh, as well as some of the, the bells and whistles that people are willing to pay for as add-ons. Sure. Um, let me address this in a second. But uh, I wanted to ask Vishal a question, actually, about his, about his, uh, his tags. When you when you did the coffee experiment, did you tag the did you tag the beans before you roasted them? Before we roasted. Oh wow, that's amazing. It, it, what's amazing is that the spores are just in in the spores that we use are just they cling to organic matter really well. I mean, especially grasses. That's why they're really good in things like leafy greens. And that's just a that's just a property of the spores. And so one of the things that actually to go back to the, the earlier question, Julie was. I remember sitting in that class and someone started talking about spores 
or at Gen Space, someone was complaining about spores actually and about how hardy they were and how like there's such a pain to get rid of. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Cause I was like, that could be, that would be the perfect way to protect any sort of tag. Mm -hmm. uh, um, how can you flip and that? So I was yeah. just like, oh, how interesting. <laughs> Oh, well, that's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and looking a bit more of your technology, Vishal, do you do you PCR, do you, um, do you, do you amplify, do you amplify the, the, tag, the tag bits of the spar before identification? We do, but we don't use PCR. We use a different type of amplification that I can't, I don't know if I can mention because I probably, Ellen will probably kill me, but we use a different <laughs> type of amplification. So we don't need to, to do it within a, using a PCR or QPCR. This is being recorded, Michelle. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can appreciate the um, careful nature of your word choice there, Michelle. <laughs> well, now for, for jumping in, I also had a question. <laughs> Just quickly, have you sent spores through the digestive systems of any animals? That is a great question. And uh, yeah, that, that's a really good, that's a big area of interest that we're currently working on. And I do, again, I don't know if I can say more about it, but there's a huge need for that. Um, because if you think about linking, just in a contamination, you go in, you're sick, linking the, 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 the sample, the human sample to the actual outbreak and the location is, is would, would, would basically truncate the time of a recall investigation from like three months to like an hour. Yep. So. Cool. Yeah. And so ongoing, uh, stay tuned. Is that the, the yeah, message we're, there, Vishal? <laughs> it just sounds so raw that I don't know what I can say. But... <laughs> no problem. I can see you looking over. I don't know if Ellen's there. Okay, then no worries. <laughs> so, Julie, I, yeah. I haven't been trying out to weasel out of, the, of answering yeah, the question. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I, I love how um, uh, engaged you guys are. I, I jump in with questions, that's fine. I'm just, just genuinely interested in, um, in this technology. Um, so, so back back to your question. If I if, you rec if I recall, this has been really just about our journey in terms of realizing that there was a customer need for for what we were building. And I think you know I think this is a great question. And uh, and so many times, you know, a, a lot of entrepreneurs I know, a lot of early stage founders I know, will spend all their time trying to build a solution for a problem which doesn't exist. So that's so that's a that's a super that's a super impo important question. That um, for us, the answer really came from a few consulting projects that we did to verify the market need before we built the software. And the the consulting projects would create exactly the same the same type of value to the to the customer instead of um, instead of uh, just a couple of hours of interacting with the software. Uh, this would be um, about a week of us running an automated pipeline um, that we've we've built we built sort of for our own internal use. So um, we were the software um, uh, as as consultants, and that's how we that's how we validated the need for for the analytical services that we provided. And um, and our premise here really was that if customers are willing to pay five thousand dollars for um, for the for this consulting service that we're offering them. They will, um, they will be, they will likely be willing to pay a similar amount of money for the same amount of value that they're going to extract from from the bit of software that that that, that, that we're going to build. And um, this, so far, from kind of early early closed betas that we were uh, we did without without software, this this assumption seems to have been proven correct. But we are really waiting for for our open beta, which will be at the end of April. Um, as we as we um, as we finalize uh, our software, to really to really learn whether whether this assumption was true, um, we just uh, we just we just um, so we you know we still we still we st we still are waiting on on verifying this market needs. Um, the one thing I'm going to say is obviously out of the, the three business businesses here, Biomage is the youngest because we only started and we only started last year in April last year. Um, so we were still relatively early on in our entrepreneurial journey. Excellent. Uh, in the people who you've interviewed, let's say the, the scientists who are using the, the software at the institutions that you mentioned, do you find that there is particular need within different, let's say, subfields? Um, you mentioned um, developmental biology. Uh, I could see this in 
um, neuroscience or, or other types of spe uh, specific areas of research? Or do you think this is a broad, you know, everyone in biomedical um, uh, research would have some sort of use? So the, yeah, so, so it's a great question. So the, the way I would say is, um, they would say this is there is, there's about 50 to 60% of the analytical needs when it comes to specifically single cell um, RNA, RNA seq data analysis. There's about 50 to 60% analytical needs which are shared across um, across different customers. Um, there is going to be always uh, always this this, um, this this around for, for around 40% of of needs which are which are really customized. And for for these customers, we are we are we are working on a on a system of plugins. That they can that they can build on top of our our software solution that their bioinformatician can build on, on top of our software solution hopefully provide it back into the open source community so that others can use them as well um, and this is uh, this is really what this is really what uh, what's working what's working out for for, for our product um, but um, the I suppose I suppose an, a kind of interesting way to approach this and I, I appreciate this going to be very different from how a lot of other um, other businesses will be built. Um, what what we what we're doing is we are we're using our um, our kind of re base of researchers as um, as a sort of the best proof of the usefulness of our product. And um, the the kind of the kind of the kind of business model that's often mentioned here is the um, is the flywheel flywheel um, sales model where um, where the people that you initially target with with your with your with your um, with your solution with your software, and um, will will act as sort of early adopters and will will take will take your software to places will, will act effectively as a as a sort of free free marketing will take your software to places where um, where where you'll be able to derive bigger revenues so sort of more business to business customers like like pharmaceutical companies. Like um, like like the clinic, um, like large government sponsored biobanks. So we're really starting small with um, with researchers, and we're hoping to use their reputation and use their influence um, to get into those those more exciting, bigger um, business to business opportunities. Yeah, excellent. Uh, kind of um, grassroots, like seeding the the scientists of tomorrow who will go and work with those um, organizations. We call it the Trojan horse approach. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to open the floor rather than ask a specific question. So we'll see, it's a little bit of an experiment. I know in Zoom times, we're all a little worried about stepping on each other's words. But one of the most common questions that was submitted with registration was how do you demonstrate as an early stage company using data that you are an ethical company? So getting a little bit into what Vishal was talking about, how do you show people or I guess, how do you garner their trust with their data or with whatever data that they are um, procuring through your services? Uh, and, you know, there are so many either big strategic visions or maybe even tactical uh, means that you may be using in your own companies. I, I welcome anyone to kind of just kick things off with this. Um, I can go first. So we actually take, we don't know what the data is. Like, that's what we, how we, Kind of pitch it to the customer which is this could be a barcode this could be your mother's faded name it doesn't really matter to us you just tell us what you want in terms of like basically length <laughs> and how many um but we don't know exactly what you're ta we, we know what you're tagging we don't know necessarily what you're tagging it with so whether that's your own internal serial code or, or whatever that's that's one way we can just say hey look y you want to tag all of these uh, lo lots of lettuce or whatever it is, but we don't know what that actually represents. You, do you mean, I'm sorry, Vishal, just to make sure I understand, do you mean that you, you um, at Anika don't know what that sequence is that you're tagging? We know what with? the sequence is, but we don't necessarily know what that sequence is representing, right? So they can I say see. 07582, like we don't know what that necessarily right, is. Right, right, right. We're just okay. sticking it into a sequence and we're sticking it into the organism, but that could mean a host of different things to that actual customer. Um, and so while, you know, if it's a lot number, a batch number, it doesn't really, it, there's no security issue as such, but if there was something sensitive, we still wouldn't know. So that's how we kind of address it with them, which is you just, you're just telling us how many you need. Uh, we, we create the unique sequences, the unique strains, so to speak. And then we assign those strains to 
whatever unique situation that they have, if that makes any sense. Michelle, uh, yeah, do, I see. Sorry, really. Michelle, do you let your customers choose the sequence that, uh, that they want? No, we just, so we, we're just creating our own sequences and then basically just linking them essentially to whatever the digital data that they want is or whatever whatever the, the serial number that they, they're looking for. Like one, one would imagine that perhaps more important than, uh, than a sort of specific message that's encoded in the DNA would be uniqueness of that message so that, so that other, other, you know, other companies or other users of your product do not come dangerously close. Exactly. We, we have almost a, an infinite coding space, as we call it. So we use both sequence and come and sort of positional. So we use actually multiple ways to create that, that the, again, the coding space. So it, we have very distinct differences from one barcode to the next. Fair enough, fair enough, that makes sense. Adam, do you have um, any customers who are working with, let's say, um, patient data who are worried about, you know, making sure that the, the information that they have is not going to be uh, misused in any way? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And it's, um, it's something that, thinks, that, keeps coming, that keeps coming up um, regularly when it comes to, when it comes to uh, genetical data or genetical information of, 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 of humans. As we stand, the, the industry standard, um, the academic standard, is that uh, data, transcriptomics data, for example, um, that's linked to a research paper will be made publicly available to any researchers, to any bona fide researchers in the field after the paper is published, um, which, is a, which, is a, which is a very, very valuable this is very valuable for for science um, because data data likes to be open and um, and and with with open data we can achieve more um, quicker and the things that when, when I see when I say we can achieve more quicker I mean things like creating um, creating uh, new creating new treatments for for diseases um, this is like cancer cardiovascular disease this is like Alzheimer's. Um, so, so these are these are these are some these are some huge challenges that that us as humanity we have to deal with, and 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 the way we deal with with those challenges is through through uh, academic research, um, through academic researchers creating creating new drug markets, um, creating, creating other sorry about that, creating, no creating other um, other types of understanding of human understanding that um, that, that that can really that can really help us. Can really help you, us. you know, Adam, that's funny because I almost felt like um, I was hemming and hawing even as I asked the question because I was thinking the answer that you were going to give would be, well, we don't deal with the data. It's other people's data and we are just a tool that overlays the, uh, the data that of course is going to be held securely in whatever you know, database it is. I don't know if that is a true statement or not or whether there, it does Biomage um, actually interface with some of this data. So, so not very much so this, these are the researchers data but you know we, we still are a part of this of this of this trend we're still a part of this um of this of this whole debate and we um you know i very i very often find myself having to, to take a to take a particular view um and in defense in defense of those um of those open source repositories with uh, with data that researchers submit um potentially patient patient information to um there is there is in fact we, we, we live in fact in a world where where actually none of us really has all that much control over our, our own genetic information because um, in, in a world where so many people have actually used services like 23andMe um, which um, which law enforcement which law enforcement can actually get get access to there will always be somebody who's even related to us who submitted their data and as a result, we can we can be found um, through through that through that connection. So um, you know it can be a second cousin uh, or a distant cousin or, or or a relative. So there is um, there is definitely there's there's definitely it's it's a, it's an it's an interesting debate where privacy privacy concerns are pitched against um, against scientific progress and against um, 
against human health. And it's, um, it's sort of like how we position ourselves and decisions that we take with response in, in, um, in relation to how we handle that data. That's, um, that's, actually, that's actually really, really important. It is, and I'm, I'm glad that we're asking these questions in panels like this, because of course, every piece of technology is a double-edged sword and it's how it's used um, that really defines who we are as human beings. Uh, and now I, I wanna to turn to Amal because I have a question more on the side of access uh, in terms of whether people would have access to this technology. It seems like you might need a, a professional to even put those um, types of um, bio modifications, I guess we'll call them, into your body to make sure that it's done sterilely, uh, whether that's cost prohibitive, whether that's something that people could have done against their will um, under work case scenarios uh, what, what are your thoughts around that Actually, sure. Sure. Can I add one thing to that question yeah also how do you take it out <laughs> yeah. well I, actually I, I was kind of uh, I'm, I'm kind of amazed at how similar our companies are Vishal and, and mine um, you know in terms of how we what we're doing we're identifying things we're using tags RFID tags bio tags you know it's there's a lot of similarities there and in, in, in a lot of ways we kind of handle the data similarly but um, you know the, the reality is, yes, you, you need to go to um, either medical professional, like a doctor, um, your family doctor could do it. But we also partner with body piercers because body piercers are everywhere. They are trained in aseptic procedure. They work out of licensed and uh, certified studios and they're cheap, right? They're, they're, you know, 50 bucks gets you a piercing or a chip. I mean, it's, it's very straightforward. So um, in terms of, again, like safety and then health concerns, a, an ear piercing is actually riskier than getting a chip implant because the chip implant just lays right in the fascia tissue between dermal and muscle layer. Um, you just lift the skin, it's a five second thing, you're over and done. And then within you know 20 minutes, your, your Band-Aid can even come off. You can wash your hands and take a shower, it's fine. Uh, ear piercing, right? You're, you put a hole through and you put metal and then you might be allergic to that metal. And then your body has to heal around this metal. And there's weeks of time where you have to be very careful and not get infected. And um, you, know, you, you could end up with a keloid scar or something like that. So in comparison, it's very low risk and also low, um, you know, low cost and, you know, to, to have it put in. Taking it out is similar. You would just, um, essentially, I've had several things in and out because I experiment with prototypes and things, but, um, but it's very simple. So it's a cylindrical tube, right? Um, two millimeters by 12 millimeters typically. And you would just essentially go to the dock or any Randall G GP and you just press, you know, when you press down, you can kind of see it pop up there, right? Ah, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So they would just make a small incision and you press it out and it just comes out like that. Now, when it comes to like animal chips, like pets for you know, dogs and cats, they have um, a bio bond or perylene, some kind of porous coating around that cylinder. And uh, the tissue grows into that coating. It locks the chip in place. And for animals, that's necessary because their scruff, the fascia tissue is very, very loose. You, know, you can pick it up and it's like, you know, a lot of, lot of leeway there. So they need that kind of, um, you know, uh, locking in. Otherwise the chip would just migrate around and you'd not know where to scan them. Uh, but for humans, our t fascia tissue is very dense. We don't need that. But the uh, upside is replacement or removal is very, very easy. Um, what was the other part of the question? <laughs> uh, access. I was, I was just wondering, because um, uh, what, what about people who want access and can't get it or... Oh no! Uh, I, I yeah. It was the uh, it was the um, uh, against your will kind of thing. So yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so really, that's not. Uh, sadly, we are. Uh, I've been contacted almost regularly for sixteen plus years by people who are clearly developing or in the early stage of developing schizophrenia. They're hearing audio hallucinations. They're hearing their own thoughts. Um, they're being monitored, and people are harassing them because their own brain. They're hearing their own brain, but they don't know that it's their own brain and the voices that are being made up. It's like dreaming, but you can't escape the dream, right? Um, so they're, they go online, they search, and they're like, people are getting chipped against their will, and, they're, and then mind control is happening and all this. And I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people I've talked to, uh, and the sad result is that by the time they get to me, because they've found this chip implant is the nefarious thing, um, 
they're unhelpable. Like I've, I've reviewed MRIs, x-rays, I've spoken to people on the phone, Zoom calls, like nobody, like they're already too far down that rabbit hole to escape. And so they're convinced they have a chip. They're convinced that it's doing mind control of some kind. They're con- and they're just no talking them out of it at all. And so the idea though, that you have to ask yourself, like if you're chipped against your will, uh, for one, the technology doesn't track anything. The technology isn't GPS. It's in fact, and completely inert when not encased in the small magnetic field generated by the reader. There's no power, there's no battery. I can't do anything. Uh, there's no, definitely no neural interfaces and we're not neural link here, <laughs> you know? Um, so all the things that they say that, uh, that these people say that a chip implant could do uh, and would be reason for maybe implanting someone against their will, um, is not tech, it's not possible. It's only possible in Hollywood movies, right? And um, and so you know we want we want to get to that future. We want to be able to cure paralysis and cerebral, cerebral palsy and all, all these things you could do if these devices could do that, uh, do what they're saying. But uh, but they can't. So there's no reason at all to chip anybody against their will. It'd be pointless. You would be giving them a gift. <laughs> I mean that the, you know what I mean. There's no there's no benefit for the uh, perpetrator, right? And in fact, the, you said that people will come to you with their, let's say, MRI or CAT scans. Yeah. Uh, the chip would not the, even the be able to interact with those. The point at something that's a little wisp of something. And, and I'm like, no, that's not a chip. I have a very famous x-ray that's out there that shows very clearly what the chips look like. It's very easy. I mean, the time, by the way, to, to like talk to people. Yeah, yeah I mean. I well, find that very... Even yesterday, oh, it was a few days ago, somebody had contacted me and they, they were, you know, it's usually a big, long email and I kind of skimmed through them um, and they, they seemed worth responding to, you know, so I, I said yes, like they, they claimed that they had a professor that they were talking to and a neurologist, so I'm like, great, this is great, you, you have professionals, I'll talk to the professionals, you link them to me. They responded, thank you so much, I'm, I'm so near suicide, I, I just can't handle this anymore, and I was just like, just get your neurologist to talk, talk to me, we, <laughs> We'll try to sort it out. But the moment I tell them it's not a chip for all these reasons, you're not the king of Brunei, you're, you're not Elon Musk, there's no reason to, If even if this technology existed in like a secret lab, why put it into you? Who are you? What value would there be for that just to harass you with voices? It doesn't make any sense on any logical level. But the moment that I start diving into that, they you know, they retract and they're like, no, 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 it's a chip you can't see on x-ray. The doctors are in on it. And it just kind of goes, it devolves from there. But I, it, I still try to make an effort at least <laughs> to try to get these people directed toward mental health professionals. But what I'm finding, I'm also finding that it's difficult for, because a doctor can't, I mean, it's, it's from the fifties, right? You, where you would put somebody into an institution, but you can't do that anymore. So the doctor really has no control. If they walk into their office, say I'm hearing voices, the doctor says, well, I think you have schizophrenia and they want to leave, they can and never come back. And that's the problem is they just don't subscribe to the treatment and they don't want to hear that. So it's kind of a lost cause, but I mean, the so idea- really, that- I mean, like the, the science communication that you're doing though, I'm all very generous uh, of you yeah, to, yeah, to spend your yeah, time yeah, to, yeah. to actually say, respond to a number of these. I will say one thing, there was one case, a legitimate case where somebody was implanted against their will and it was based on FUD or fear, uncertainty and doubt uh, or ignorance of what the chips are capable of. And it was actually a case where a sex worker was imprisoned by her pimp, right? And that they, he went down to the vet office, got some pet chips and just p- started putting them in the legs of his victims and said, I can track you now, so don't try to leave obviously not true right and so but it kept it kept through the fear of this it kept them in the in the ignorance it kept them from leaving it was but, true, or do you like was he it was just a mind trick like it was just a mind trick it, it's not he's just saying now i can track you but he, it you I, can't means a reader yeah yeah, yeah you absolutely cannot i mean if you get within two inches of the person you could read it and go there you are but um, <laughs> you know no it was purely because they believed they saw mission impossible they know they know these chips exist and can, attra- can be tracked. So, you know, that that misinformation was used against them. Uh, but one, one person, I don't give a crap, I'm going to the hospital. And uh, they went right to the hospital, said, hey doc, I got a chip put in me by my whatever, uh, I need to take it out. And they're like, 
yeah, whatever, right? They thought she was mental, but then they did an x-ray and they're like, oh, wow, there is one. And they took it out and they wrote a paper. Um, and her story is like the only legitimate case where I could say somebody was actually implanted against their will. Um, but yeah, out of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, it's, it's the only one. Oh, very fascinating. And I'm surprised that there actually is a documented case uh, where it happened. Yeah. So we're, we're running short on time. I do want to ask you, all three of you, um, to speculate about the future. Uh, and kind of uh, actually speaking of Mission Impossible, I mean, when that movie came out, it was what, 20 or 30 years in the future, right? So let's move not just in the next five to 10 years, let's move further into the future and speculate within your your different fields, whether it's, um, you know, the ability to discern transcriptomics or, or even just all genetic data through software, tracking things through either genetic barcodes or these um, implanted barcodes. And before I turn the mic over, I want to front load the, the thank yous because I always forget this part. Thank you so much to Josh Torrey and Lindsay Atkinson who are uh, running the show and making sure that all of the tech is running properly. We are very grateful for all of your help. Um, and with that, uh, I would be happy to let anyone go first to kind of take us into the future in terms of not only where you think the future is going, but opportunities for young early entrepreneurs to move into. Um, I guess I could go first. Um, I try to be very vague because in doubt, you know, invariably you, you make a prediction about the future, it doesn't come true. And then people 50 years from now laugh at what an idiot you were. So um, I'll be very vague, but I think the, in general terms, it's very clear that we're seeing a, an acceleration toward integration of technology into our bodies. Um, we're seeing a genetic scientific freedom to explore genetic alterations. Um, I, I think that in, in, in terms of like where we want to go as a species off planet, uh, to the depths of the ocean, whatever, we might even see through these, um, commoditizations of these types of technologies, uh, divergence in our species where we have people that are fundamentally at a genetic level branched off and doing their own thing. Um, spacefarers. That might is be more than 20 to 30 years, I would imagine, but well, I mean, uh, yes. <laughs> you know, exponential technology development is exponential technology development. You really can't tell if it's going to be 50 years or 300 years. I mean, it could be so, so fast. Um, you know, you look at the gaps between democratization and technology, like it took you know, 50 plus years for everybody to get a refrigerator, but you know, only, you know, really 10, 10, 10 years at the most maybe to, for, to go from the first commercial um, cell phones to like a lot of people having them and now it's ubiquity. We don't have landlines anymore. And that's such a short amount of time. And it's only getting shorter as we progress in the future. So I, for me to say it's 50 years, that's dumb. It could be more, but it could, it could be less for some of these things at least. I mean, they're, there's genetically modified babies in China living their lives, you know, like who's to say that it might be so long, especially if people go underground with a democratized accessible technology, hmm. who knows? That's true. All right, I appreciate your vagueness. That's a very interesting perspective. Um, Adam, would you like to make a prediction? And if, you, if 20 to 30 years seems far out, I mean, we appreciate even 10 to, or five to 10 years here uh, in terms of where you think different genetic um, manipulation tools, I guess we'll call them, or um, uh, to sorting here. tools. So I'm going to do here exactly the opposite of what Amal did. I'm going to make a very specific prediction. All right, now, we're here for it. Put me in 20 years time, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just take, I'll just take, I'll, my ego is going to take a hit. <laughs> uh, so, the, so the prediction I'm going to make is that within the next 20 years majority of patients um, uh, in diseases such as cancer are actually going to use precision medicine. And what I mean by precision medicine is they will, they will, um, they will, they will take an assay um, that is going to look at the molecular basis of the disease of the particular type of cancer or the particular type of disease that they have. And they will see treatment which is tailored to, um, to, that, to, that, to, that, to that specific instance of the disease that they have. And, um, and more specifically, I think, I, I believe that a single, cell, a single cell technique is going to become part of that precision medicine landscape. So, um, so when, we look, when we look at single cell NAC, which is the technology that Biomage is built on top of, um, what this te technology allows us to do is it allows us to look at individual 
cells in a, um, in a sample, in a tissue sample. It could be a cancer sample. And it allows us to measure for each of those individual cells, it allows us to measure the, 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 gene the, the full genetic picture of what's happening in that cell. And so we, we can measure a full, a full transcriptome or nearly a full, a full transcriptome. And there are already techniques which are, um, which, are, which, are, which are becoming commercially viable where on top of being able to measure a full, a full, a full, a full, a full, a full genomic information of every single cell in a, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a in a in a sample in a tissue sample, we can also get to know where they were positioned in in the um, in the tissue. So this is called spatial transcriptomics. So on top of on top of having those, as I mentioned earlier, two hundred million um, data points, we're actually getting also information. On top of that, we're getting information on. Um, uh, on spatial coordinates of those of those different cells that we've worked with, um, so the so the um, so, so, so the so the um, so so my prediction is is I'm, I'm just really big on on precision medicine. Um, I'm a big believer in precision medicine actually happening within within the sort of 20, 20 year time scale, and and I and I believe that and I believe that single cell some some form of single cell technology is going to be a big part of this of this of this story. Excellent, excellent answer. And I would easily go another, I don't know, hour talking about some of those uh, ways that it will be implemented, but unfortunately we are drawing toward the end. Um, thank you. Uh, and Vishal, could you please paint a picture of the future um, in terms of these genetic tags and how they might be implemented in ways well beyond uh, what we can even do, what we are capable of doing today? Perfect. So um, one, Adam, I totally agree with you on precision medicine. I think it's it's inevitable. Um, but and I've got sort of two, two predictions. One, company-wise, one of the things we're actually working on today, um, just signed a huge partnership um, last month with a company that will go public soon, um, is actually creating functionality for a tag. So not only do you have a tag, but it's now able to be antimicrobial, bacteriostatic, increase nutrients of the food. So we look at it as our tag as just a platform, and then we can add proteins as almost like biological apps. Um, sort of part of just enhancing the food system and food safety. But sort of wrapped in that, the bigger prediction is on GMOs. So I think that the world is going to have to uh, sort of change its stance on genetically modified organisms because of climate change. And I think the, I, I think the, 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 it would shift it so anti-GMO sort of illogically because of things like Monsanto and sort of miscommunication around that. And now I think it's going to, and you're already seeing it with things like the Impossible Burger. Like I think consumers are now starting to put kind of ESG and environmental friendliness and climate change above just a blanket. We don't like GMOs. And I think that's going to be a major tailwind for you know our whole industry and our sector and specifically our business. But I think that especially for the next, I think this will happen in the next five years or ten years. But I think if you know we're going to protect our crops and, and and really like take on climate change head on uh and obviously people's stances on climate change vary but i won't get into that but like <laughs> um the way to do it is through gmos and i think that as a technology is just going to be uh, again inevitable and something that everyone's going to have to embrace and and i think it's going to happen over the next decade Interesting. Uh, obviously, we at IndieBio think the same because we are <laughs> investing in that uh, as part of the future. Wonderful. Well, I want to take a moment to thank all three of our panelists. This has been a really great discussion in terms of the many different ways that data and biotech can uh, work together to create a better future. So thank you so much. And I should mention here that we're in three different time zones with our three different founders. So thank you for staying up uh, you know, working past the, the business hours there, Adam, over in Poland. Thank you for uh, a kind of early morning for you, Amal, over on the West Coast. And Vishal, we're both in New York. Um, so at least it's a smack dab in the middle of our day. <laughs> Thank you to all three of you. Thanks a lot, Joey. Thanks. Hey, pleasure being here. This was um, a lot of fun, and we will do it again. Um, stay tuned if you're interested in joining additional IndieBio New York events. There's a newsletter linked below. There's a little button that says our events newsletter. Go ahead and uh, click that, subscribe, and join us next time. Thanks, everyone. Yes, we're in the lab space. Amazing, right? Oh, cool. yeah, it looks really good. Well, you're yeah. actually standing. It's just like it's so different. I am. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. What's funny is that you, I, some of the backgrounds are so good that I don't know. You think it's a fake background? I, I I, I'm, com I'm complimented. Yeah, no, it's so good. It looks so neat. <laughs>